this is the second time I've appeared at uh, this forum since we transformed ourselves from what was a pre-revenue, uh, really a patent portfolio company, into what we are now, which is a platform company dedicated to introducing high-end technology to the marketplace, a company that generates revenues, generates profits, has cash flow, and literally makes money. I was uh, very happy last time I appeared to report to you or to the people that were in San Diego that we had just celebrated our first profitable quarter. And I told those people that that was not an aberration, it was a trend. And I'm very happy to come back to you today and express the fact that that trend has continued. In fact, the third quarter of 2010 was a record-setting quarter for us. We generated year-to-date revenues of $29 million, up 44% year to year. We did that while reducing our SG&A from 39% in 2009 to 29%, a 10% reduction in 2010, and while maintaining a margin of about 40%, which is what we shoot for. We're cash flow positive, and I think I can say with confidence that the simple message I can give you is that this company is a growth and value play based on performance and fundamentals, not on promises and projections. I'm not talking to you about pretend numbers, projected numbers, promised numbers. I'm talking about cash that we are making, revenues that we are generating, profits that we are putting into our pocket and back into the business, which is our commitment. So let's talk a little bit about this company and why I'm so enthusiastic about it. Uh, we are a uh, publicly traded company, so we do have to make the disclaimer that some of the information you'll get in this presentation is forward-looking. It is, though, all public in nature. The company uh, is based in Tualatin, Oregon, which is in the Portland, Oregon metro area. We are based about 20 minutes outside of Portland, and we have about 81 employees. As I mentioned, we are traded over the counter. Uh, our ticker symbol is C-U-G-I or Kugi. Uh, our employees are broken down to about 50 in uh, Tualatin, which is our main headquarters and our main distribution center. We have a R&D and quality control group in China, uh, which oversees some of our manufacturing operations. There's three people there. We have one person in uh, administrative individual in Florida and 26 individuals in a subsidiary we own in Japan, which I'll talk about in a few seconds. We are, in fact, a global presence. We have facilities throughout the, the world, and we have that because we want to deliver product globally. As I mentioned, Tualatin is our main distribution center. Uh, China is our main R&D facility. Tokyo, Japan, we have both lightweight manufacturing. Uh, we have some distribution in Japan. And really, I'll talk more about why we got into Japan in just a few minutes. We then have manufacturing locations in China, Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea. Our product lines and services are fairly diverse. We have currently in the market about 2,200 separate SKUs, servicing about 20,000 separate customers. We do things like this. Our, our primary area is, in fact, power supply, DC to DC and AC to DC, and it runs through our company called V-Infinity. We provide power supplies, blocks or, di or, or uh, bricks, if you will, that power computers, that power Motorola's uh, sling box, that Motorola's Wi-Fi stations, that provide power for uh, Verizon telephones. We provo provide all those little things that put power into the, uh, into the different things that you use to compute, to talk on a telephone, to do the things that you do. We also provide motion control devices. Motion control devices are simply devices that translate computer speak into motion. So if you have an industrial robot that requires itself to do certain functions, we're the people who provide those small devices that tell the robot what to do when the computer tells it what to do. We, for example, provide the AMT computer, or rather a motion control device, which interestingly is a new unique device we put into the market last year. As an example of how we're growing, one of our biggest distribu distribution partners is a company called DigiKey, the fourth largest electronics distribution company in the world. They service design engineers, engineers who put their products and our products into their designs and then market them out with those designs using our internal products. I was told last month, the month of January, our AMT encoder was bought by 109 new engineers. That means 109 new engineers put our AMT encoder, a very unique device, into 109 new projects. You'll see in a few minutes how that impacts our growth and how that puts us into an evergreen situation where we are confident that our growth will continue through 2011, 2012, and into the future. We also do components, connectors, which are not, nothing more than wire assemblies. They're the wires that connect your TV to your, to your uh, Bluetooth or to your uh, Blu-ray that connect computers to the, the screens. So those are wire assemblies. We do buzzers, backup buzzers, for example, for golf carts. We do speakers. We were just selected as the speaker to be used in the new Amazon Kindle device. So again, we do speakers, microphones, and some thermal products as well. But most importantly, what we do is we provide world-class logistics 
and customer service. We have a computerized system on our website where all of our 2200 SKUs, for example, are already in the design programming needed by design engineers. So a design engineer who comes to our website can pull one of our products off of that website, come plug it into their drawings without doing any build out or anything else, can put that product in there and see how it works, can then get on the phone with our engineering support team, we can tweak it over the internet, design it, custom design it for his product, and then create and build it and deliver it to him. That's unique in the industry, and that's why have, we have been so successful. Our logistics department also, unique in the industry. I worked, uh, when I was an attorney working as, uh, as a corporate counsel, for one of the largest producers of DVDs in the world. And at that time, that product was being produced at a rate of 277 million items a year being shipped all over the world. And I will tell you that the logistics department I have at CUI Global is better than the logistics I had there. Our logistics department can take any product we make and deliver it anywhere in the world within 48 hours. And understand something, 60% of our products are built to suit. We do not carry a lot of inventory. That's again key to our margins and key to our profitability, not carrying a lot of inventory. We also have in-house testing so we can test our customers' products if they need them tested, either for endurance, for hot and cold, for vib vibration testing and others. Again, we provide world-class customer service in the form of both engineering support and logistics. Some of our customers, customers, and these are current customers, not customers we're going after, but customers we are currently servicing are some of the biggest customers in the world. GE, Philips Medical, Microsoft, Honeywell, Electrolux, Kohler, Motorola, as I mentioned, is a big customer of ours, and Digikey, the fourth largest electronics distributor in the world. So again, this is performance and fundamentals, not promises and projections. This is a company that's currently generating revenues and currently generating profits, and all of those revenues and profits are increasing quarter to quarter and year to year. Our sales breakdown in 2010 was very similar to what it was in 2009. We think it'll be a little different in 2011 because of some of the new products that we're introducing, but about 60% of what we do is power. And that power is, as I mentioned to you, internal and external power controls, power supplies that provide AC to DC or DC to DC conversion. About 14 to 15% of uh, our, our revenues come from motion control, those devices I talked to you about, and then the others are component, a mishmash of other things that we provide to the market, which provides the rest of our sales. As I mentioned to you, one of the things that we're most proud of is our acquisition in 2009 of a company called Comex. We own 49% of Comex, and we have rebranded it as CUI Japan. We took that company, more importantly than anything else, for the customers that they brought to us. They brought some of the most iconic Japanese customers, Honda, Sony, Toyota, Fujitsu, Mitsubishi, Japan Rail, Japan Defense Force. And the reason we did that is because we found that Japan was a very parochial market. Japan companies don't buy from foreign companies. They buy from Japanese companies. And we wanted to penetrate that market. We knew we needed to have a Japan presence, and we did. That's why we bought the company we bought. Since that time, we've been very successful. As I point out there on the slide, last year through third quarter, we had sold $2.7 million in revenues from our products into Japan. 2.7 million that we didn't get before because Japanese com com companies simply didn't buy US products. An added bonus to this uh, was that we acquired a lightweight manufacturing operation there where we are now making the AMT encoders. So instead of having our standard 40% gross margins on that AMT encoder, we now capture the manufacturing margin and the margin on that product is over 60% to us. So again, a great piece of business that became even greater because of our acquisition of Japan. One of the other milestones we hit this year, which I think is of great importance to any new shareholder and to our current shareholders, is we managed to change all of our banking relationships, both our credit lines and our bank policy, uh, deposits and, and the billables and payables, to Wells Fargo Bank. We took our banking relationships from two small regional banks and, and transferred them to one of the largest, most respected banking institutions in the world. Why did we do that? Two reasons. One is because we're expanding and we really felt a bigger bank would be able to better service us. But the byproduct of that is something that should be very important to each and every one of you. The byproduct is this. It took us six months to qualify to change our banking relationships to Wells Fargo. My CFO, Dan uh, Ford, is in the audience today because he and I are, are about to embark on a big uh, IR campaign. His, he and his group of accountants really had the burden to get together the reporting requirements to get us involved with Wells Fargo Bank. And if you think the STC requirements are difficult, they 
pale in comparison to Wells Fargo. We report to Wells Fargo on a daily basis pretty much everything we do. Why is that important to you or to a future shareholder, or to a current shareholder? Because we have been made better by that process. We have to report to Wells Fargo, who is now our partner. And Wells Fargo makes sure we make good decisions at the right time with the right information because we have to justify those decisions to Wells Fargo. That is a very, I think, important factor for anyone in getting into our company as an investor to take into account. We not only are a fully compliant, fully reporting SEC company, but we report on a daily basis, literally, to our financial partner, Wells Fargo Bank, to make sure that what we are doing is correct, proper, and a good business play. That's why Wells Fargo was so important. What Wells Fargo has now for us is a $4 million credit line and all of our um, uh, deposits, payables, receivables. They handle all of our banking. One of the other things we accomplished last year, actually over the last two years, which we're very proud of, is we managed to restructure a great deal of debt we had, which we felt was really holding us back from getting the value that we thought we deserved. In May of 2008, we acquired CUI, and in conjunction with that acquisition, we acquired about $41 million in debt. At that time, that debt was 36 months. It was really short term. In fact, it was due and payable in May of this year, about two months from now. We were accruing or paying about $420,000 a month in interest payments, an incredible burden for us, as you can imagine. Over the last year and a half, we have reduced that dramatically. In fact, we've taken that debt from $41 million down to $15 million, which includes our line of credit. We've extended the debt out from 36 months to 94 months, which means it's now not due till 2018. And we've reduced our interest payments from $400,000 a month to $75,000 a month, which we can do through cash flow. Again, a big change. Most significantly, we were able to do that with a very small dilution. We took our market cap or our, our structure from 165 million shares outstanding to about 205 million shares, or about a 25% addition which really we did because we had a lot of support from our major shareholders and many angel investors who believe in what we're doing, believed in where we were going, and were willing to convert debt at a premium. The same thing occurred with the prior owner, who agreed to relieve or even terminate some of his debt because, again, he believed in where we were going and what we were doing. So, again, now we have a debt structure that we can handle very easily on our cash flow and that has us set up to move, I think, to the next level. And I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. One of the other things we did, and probably one of the most major changes we made in the company over the last year, is we restructured the sales force. When we acquired CUI, which was a working operating company, that had been, in fact, founded in 1989, so it was over 20 years old, and has never, ever had a non-profitable quarter, interestingly. They had a small in-house sales group of about 10 people, and we realized that if we restructured that sales group, we felt we could really grow the business. And as those growth rates show, we were right. We hired a man by the name of Mark Adams who had 17 years experience at Future uh, Electronics. He was an expert in putting together manufacturer rep organizations. We now have not 10 internal salespeople. We have nine rep organizations with 84 individual reps out in the field working our products. The majority of those reps are degreed engineers, most electrical engineers, some other engineers. And we now cover all of North America. We cover into Mexico, up into Canada. We have two committed manufacturer rep organizations in Europe that cover all of Europe, which is why Europe is becoming such a growth area for us. Significantly, these people are independent contractors, which means they don't add to our SG&A except incrementally. In other words, they don't get paid unless they sell. They get paid strictly on commission, so that means when they sell something, we pay them. That's an excellent way for us to reduce our SG&A, which, of course, we continue to do. And then finally, we've added an in-house field sales manager for the East Coast. He's based in Boston, and it's really showing us some, some great uptick in business we're doing on the East Coast now because we have a presence. And last, not on this slide because we just were able to do it, we have now hired an in-house field sales manager for the Silicon Valley area in Northern California. So again, another market that we expect to tap into. What has that sales restructure done for us? Well, let me show you. What it has done is this, and this is why we're so confident that our growth is going to continue. I can, I can report to you that third quarter of last year, our new sales orders, sales orders in the pipeline, went from $7 million that quarter in 2009 to $12 million third quarter of 2010, up 65%. Most significantly, our year-end numbers, which we actually have already reported in, in regards to sales orders, is up 60%, $16 million. Year, new orders year-end of 2010 went from $26 million in 2009 up to $42 million 
in 2010. What does that mean? What that means is that we already have in the pipeline orders that will continue our 30 plus percent growth rate through 2011. And that only applies to our legacy business, the business I've just shown you. This year we expect to introduce three new technologies into the market that have the potential, certainly, of increasing our, our uh, revenues and our profitability by a, a great multiple. Let's talk a little bit about those. The first of those is digital power. We have uh, entered into an agreement last year with uh, Power One and Powervation to produce a digital power module. What this does is quite simple. Up until now, analog power has been the way that most computers, most devices are powered. So in your laptop computer, there's six or eight different elements that require different power supplies. There's a CPU at four volts, there may be a fan at 12 volts, a video card at six volts, and all of those are now being powered by one analog power chip. So if there's six elements that need six different power, there's six different power chips that are providing that power. It's redundant, it's inefficient, and most importantly, it creates heat and what's called vampire power usage. Those of you that have a computer, for example, sitting at home, running but not operating, whether you know it or not, it's drawing power. Because as long as it's plugged in and turned on, it's vampire power usage is about 30% of what its normal power usage would be. So again, it's using a lot of power. Digital power doesn't do that. We can provide one power chip that provides virtually unlimited power levels. So those six elements in that laptop computer can plug into one power chip and get serviced at their various levels. Two things happen. One is it's more efficient. Two is it's cooler. And most importantly, digital cuts the power off completely when the device is not in use. There is no vampire power usage. Well, that doesn't mean much in one computer. But what it does mean to Cisco, Juniper, extreme networks is literally millions of dollars in power savings and that's why digital power is so exciting. We literally have the digital power uh, supply that now is recognized as the leader in the modular market. In fact this morning if you saw our press release it was just announced that Electronics Design Magazine has nominated our digital module for their Innovation Product of the Year Award for 2010. Their article that came from the Digital Power Forum recognized us as being 18 months to two years ahead of the market because of what we've been able to design in our digital power market module. Again, a very exciting piece of technology that's just in the testing phase right now with a couple of very large telecommunication companies and that we expect to see revenue from this year and into next year. The other technology that we're very excited about is this Cepic Fed Buck Converter Topology. Without getting into the, uh, the, the uh, technical aspects of it, it's a different way of designing the power chip. It makes the power chip about 20% more efficient. And here's what it means to us. We can make a power chip that's the same size and produces twice the power, or that's half the size and produces the same power. So it's, it's about real estate, especially when you're talking, for example, about in the aircraft industry where space is king. We can produce power supplies that are smaller, yet still as efficient and still as powerful as those that are twice as large. Or we can produce twice the power from the same footprint. Again, a significant opportunity for us, and it gives us a roadmap of products that will probably last another 10 years. Most significantly, our single biggest competitor, a company called Syncor, has just become involved in a patent infringement lawsuit with one of their competitors, Artisan, and three of the biggest uh, telecommunication companies in the world, Juniper, Cisco, and Extreme Networks. Syncor is insisting that no one use their technology because there's been an infringement uh, by Artisan. And because of that, the courts issued a broad injunction against that technology being used. Our technology, which has already been ruled not to infringe on Syncor's technology, does the same thing that Syncor's does, but does it without that infringement. I can tell you that we've already been contacted by some of those large telecommunication companies who are looking to use our product as a replacement for Syncor. That, again, is a huge opportunity for us and something that we expect to see fulfilled in 2011. And then the last technology that I'll present to you is one that's close to my heart, and that is the gas quality inferential measurement device called the Gas PT2. It's an electronic device that allows gas companies, transmission companies, producers like Chevron, Shell, and BP to monitor natural gas in the pipeline electronically. The significance of this is simple. Right now, the technology that's used to monitor gas is a gas chromatograph. It burns gas, and it takes about 8 to 20 minutes to give the supplier an accurate representation of what's in the pipeline. In those large pipelines, gas is moving at 60 miles an hour, which means when those companies know what the gas is in their pipeline, it's 8 to 20 miles down the pipeline. 
Our device monitors that gas in two to four second increments. So every two to four seconds, that gas provider is finding out exactly what's in that pipeline. Why is that significant? Well, I just got back from Europe and Houston, where I met with some of the largest gas producing and transmitting companies in the world. I'm happy to say the National Grid in the United Kingdom, Gas Uni in the Netherlands, Snam Ready in Italy, and Enegas in Spain have already petitioned their regulators to certify our device, the Gas BT2, as the only electronic transmission device that will be an alternative to the gas chromatograph. What does that mean to us? It means sales of thousands of these units. They're half the price, initially, of a gas chromatograph, and they're a quarter of the price over a 10-year lifetime because they are solid state and require no calibration, no technician, no support. I was in Houston last week. Significantly, I got to meet with Chevron, who we're talking to about entering into a joint venture now to modify this to be used on their fuel gases. And I met with GE Energy yesterday, in fact, just yesterday morning. GE Energy is facing a situation where they're now running gas turbines with gas chromatographs working as the engine control. Problem is, eight minutes, that's the delay. It takes them eight minutes to learn what the gas is that's going into that gas turbine. They came to us looking for a fast way to monitor what's going into their machine so they can control those emissions. There is literally nothing that can give them anything faster than two to four seconds. And we are now entering into negotiations with GE to start testing so that they can phase these in to put on their, ga their uh, gas turbines. Understand something, there's 8,000 gas turbines in the world right now, and this device would be applicable to every single one of them. And as emissions become more and more important, it's gonna be more important as to what this device can do. Interestingly enough, and significant for anybody getting in this uh, in, in investment in our company, this device retails for around $25,000 a piece with a very, very effective 55% net margin. It's going to be a very, very nice piece of business for us, and we expect to see it in the market being bought. It will be in the market actually this month in its beta test form, but it will be actually in the market on production third quarter of this year. Again, a very nice piece of business for us. What that means to you, what that means to me, what that means to all of our investors is, again, we are basing what we believe to be a very, very valuable growth play on fundamentals and performance. Performance that I mentioned to you before. Revenues up 40 plus percent. And while I can't talk about the year end numbers because we're not releasing them till the end of the month, I can tell you that we've projected $40 million in revenues, an increase of over 30 percent. And we believe that we will meet or exceed those numbers. So again, this is a company that is performing, that has good fundamentals, and is, that, it, that is a, a value play right now. And that's why I can say, with great confidence that we will go to 60 million or around 60 million in 2011 and we will exceed 100 million in 2012. Again, I present this company because I think it is a very good value and growth play and as David men mentions, David has been a big supporter of the company for many years and that's why we continue to come to AMI, AMI and we believe it's a very valuable uh, uh, place for us to be. David, thank you and thank you.